I guess you can hear me. Um, my name is uh, Nikhil Vaze, and you're here at the uh, managing microservices at scale with OpenStack, Docker. Um, so here's a little bit about me. Um, I am a software engineer on the electric cloud engineering team. And you can find me on uh, GitHub and Twitter over here. So just a little bit about electric cloud uh, to kind of frame the rest of the presentation. They're just about uh, just a couple of slides. We are an enterprise software company that focuses on application delivery, trying to get um, software out faster for our customers and users. Um, everything from when a developer commits all the way to production. Um, so that's just kind of our, our industry and our space. Specifically, I spend my time on our integrations and plugins. Um, I'm the team lead for, for this group. And we, um, you can think of all the different tools that exist, um, be it source control, app servers, issue tracking. So we have to um, have plugins for all these different pieces so people can construct their delivery pipelines um, with using these, these tools. Let's see, so my general, uh, my experience about Docker is um, I'm a, the co-organizer for Docker Santa Clara. So this is uh, in California in the United States. And uh, took part of the Docker Hackathon in 2014, 2015. And um, in 2014, um, we was part of a team that did, that did well. So uh, just humor me for a little bit of audience participation um, for me to gauge um, who here has heard of Docker? If you can keep your hands up, okay. If you've typed Docker run, keep your hands up. Okay, great. If you use Docker in dev and test, keep your hands up. Okay, if you use it in production, keep your hands up. Okay, cool. And the last one, you've exported a Docker container and you've run it with systemd spawn. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, it's funny. W one year ago when I asked this question at the DevOps, uh, the um, the Enterprise Summit in 2014 in California, the drop-off was um, everyone heard of Docker, and then when it was come when it came time to Docker run, everyone put their hand down, and uh, it's just remarkable to see kind of pretty soon these these next slides I, I won't really even need um, because everyone will know these. So I guess real quick because everyone is mostly familiar with with Docker, um, you know, why are people excited about containers? So when we, uh, when we talk to our users, this number one, you know, it, it s typically starts, or how we're seeing it, it, it starts in dev and test. So developers really pick it up, and they're excited because now they can encapsulate their software tool chain in a container. So to give an example, if you want to do a Maven build in the past, w you put what we did at least is we put Maven on a network share, then our build lanes would reference that Maven, um, the Maven binary. And if we wanted to upgrade Maven or if we wanted to use Python, we would have to go through a process where we took, uh, where we filed a ticket, got IT to put something on the network share, and now it would be available to our build lanes. Now, um, I think that's still there, but uh, nowadays people are putting the tool chain into the container and distributing the container across the build agents. Um, so this is just maybe from personal experience where that's where people start. And um, you know, the, so the rest are you know, just development production parity. Uh, container, the startup times are really, really fast. Um, if you've ever, I guess you guys have, have done, uh, everyone has done Docker run, so I won't get, in, uh, get into that. And finally, Microsoft is on board, so you know, the fact that uh, typically I have a Windows laptop and my Windows experience with the Docker CLI is great, it works. And it almost worked from the first day, you know? And why? That's a credit to Microsoft and the Microsoft engineers that made that possible. And typically, um, you know, with previous open source tools like um, Vagrant, uh, it, for example, um, <laughs> Windows support was kind of 
a distant second, you know, maybe even third. So uh, it's just exciting to see um, to see Microsoft making these changes. So I don't know if there are any employees uh, in the audience. Um, okay, so real quick, you know, Docker, it's open source, used to wrap LXC. Uh, it's really, really fast. Um, I'm going, this I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll explain this as if I were to explain to a coworker uh, what the value prop of, of Docker is. You know, VMs we're all, we're all familiar with. There's a hypervisor, take that away with containers. There's a little bit of kernel that's shared in between the host and guest. Um, all Docker is doing is wrapping the core Linux primitives, namespaces, um, C groups, and they've implemented this in Go. It used to be called libcontainer, now it's called run C. So um, on Linux, all they're doing is wrapping the Linux kernel in Go, and on Windows, they're going to be, um, I guess, doing the same for the Windows and Nano server. So over here, you can kind of see the, um, the Docker client, that's the CLI, it must be attached or talked to a Docker daemon. And typically, that's always Linux. Now that's changing with Windows. And most of the times when I explain this, um, having kind of a diagram, uh, I guess it's a little bit hard to see. But um, let's say we have this laptop. There's a CLI. I must point it. So this is a Mac laptop. I must point it to a Linux box, typically um, running the Docker daemon. This way, you get Docker installed on your host, but really you're just controlling another, it's like a remote control for a VM that is running a Docker daemon. And in the past, that's where I've seen some misunderstanding. So, okay, great. We've, everyone is up to speed with Docker. So let's, let's talk a little bit about microservices. So Docker, uh, in fact, at DockerCon, I believe the t-shirt, the back, um, kind of written in the back was like uh, a monolith, uh, our container a day keeps the monolith away. So hand in hand with Docker's popularity, microservices have started to become popular. And the reason, these are the reasons why. And uh, originally uh, the CTO of Electric Cloud kind of presented these. Um, I liked them, so I grabbed a bit. So I might be a little bit choppy here. So, you know, people are really excited about microservices because um, it provides, I guess, this two pizza, what Amazon calls like the two pizza teams. You know, you can grab teams, segregate them, and work on small pieces and then combine them together. And actually, the, what I kind of, um, Amazon says this because if you look at AWS, um, I know this is OpenStack, but um, so even actually similar to OpenStack, you know, there are each individual service that is independently managed, released, and typically has a REST API, um, definitely an OpenStack's case. And, um, you know, you can group them together, but they're not necessarily coupled with each other. So, you know, what are the good and bads about monolithic applications uh, versus, you know, I, I guess with, with monolithic apps? So. You know, it's when you have one code base, it's um, it's pretty, well, testing is never easy, but it is easier than testing a microservices app. When you're starting out, it, um, it's pretty easy to do one series of either Vagrant files or, or Docker files to create a consistent development environment. And that's why people think it's, it's sort of easier to develop. And one thing is easier to deploy than, than many. So you know what are what are the what are the bads? So as an application grows, it becomes harder to see where the delineations are uh, from module to module, or perhaps you didn't use any modules. And it over time it becomes hard for onboarding, harder to um, to to take different pieces out and put new pieces in. And this, um, this particular one about harder to adopt new technologies, um, if you are shipping the JVM and you have a JVM app, um, it's harder to uh, take a go to adopt a service that's, or in, you know, within your product to adopt Golang or Python. Um, so this is kind of where microservices really come in. Um, 
So, okay, great. What's, what's so cool with, with microservices? So now there's loose coupling, and typically it is a REST, um, REST API or the network. Um, if, if not REST, then you know, MQTT or um, something asynchronous, but usually the network. And with scaling and monoliths, you, know, you have to scale everything, or you have, to, you, you have to scale the entire monolith. Here you can scale individual services. Um, so the, I guess what I, it, kind of firsthand experience, you know, we chose um, Golang for a new project because of the way it has statically compiled uh, binaries that's easy, that are easy to distribute. So if there, so w our use case, we are typically a JV, we, we use the JVM um, quite a bit, but for a new project, we wanted to use Golang. And now people can use the, so there, there are two ways. You can, um, you can use the technology that you are most productive in so it, with teams, think of acquisitions or um, a new team in, in a new geography. Perhaps they don't want to be bound by the original technology stack. Um, or it, I guess you get to choose, yeah, you just get to choose the technology that's best suited for your business problem. Um, so we've already talked about two person, or sorry, the two, the two pizza teams. So, okay, great. So microservices, monoliths, um, should I, you know, should you use microservices? So what, what we're trying to say here is um, there are a lot of prerequisites or things you should do before you just jump on the microservices bandwagon and kind of the bottom, you know, microservices are not a magic hammer that'll make your other problems go away. So you must have CI. If you think, um, you know, CI and good testing, if you think managing one thing without automation is hard, imagine 10, 20. And, um, yeah, that's that's typic That's really the, the three bullet points here. Um, you know what's difficult about about microservices. So, when you start off um, in a, in a later slide, the the kind of the guidance is start off with a monolith and break it up into microservices. That's kind of the guidance. But okay, you know everyone is solving business problems. Where do pieces start and end? That can be difficult. Um, when much like the, the build automation piece, um, when you have one thing, when you have a monolith and you have one thing to monitor, it is perhaps easier than monitoring 10 pieces. And I guess not only is it, it, it's more than just monitoring, it's you know logging. Everything is on the network. So each of your services, if they're logging a response, that response should, should agree on a format. So it's call response like R-E-S-P, don't, don't call it RSP or R, you know, uh, keep it consistent across all of your microservices, otherwise you're gonna run into problems. So okay, am I, am I ready for microservices? You know, the, so Martin Fowler, the general guidance is, you no, know, first start with a the monolith, then move to, to a, a microservice based architecture, solve your, like figure out your business problem, and then um, go forward from monolith to microservice. And, you know, automation and monitoring, you need to be, you, you need to, those are prerequisites before you can jump into this. Um, so here was just a funny tweet that um, Marius, uh, Marius Ducia sent, which was, um, if you don't, this is a consequence of not um, keeping monitoring, um, doing monitoring correctly. So we, we replaced our monolith with microservices so that every outage could be more like a murder mystery. Um, okay, so great. We talked about Docker, uh, we talked about microservices. Um, to combine the two, containers are a great way to ship your microservice. Um, that's kind of implicit, but um, now that you've had, you have many, now that you've broken up your monolith into different pieces, each piece can be a container, it can be, it can be deployed, um, and you can enforce some level of, of consistency with Docker. So let's talk about continuous delivery or, or, you know, delivery pipelines. Let's just, let's just go with this. So this is kind of the example of a pipeline back in the day that's a monolith. And um, these are kind of the individual pieces. So, you know, you can see this is kind of a dated slide uh, based on like subversion. But th this is really what it takes for a commit, either pre-commit pre or, or really you, you check in, all the way, you know, to, um, to check-in time or really to 
where the, um, the build artifact gets produced and published to an artifact repository. So over here, okay, the code's that in Subversion, you know, over here, the, um, let's say if it's, it's, if it's Java, the, the Maven module gets published over here. Um, so, okay, so source control and artifact repository. The other thing I wanted to call out was um, Chef or configuration management. Typically, people would write, or they still do, they, they write uh, Chef recipes or they write a blueprint of how you want your middleware. Um, how do you want your wild flight configured, installed? How do you want Tomcat, et cetera? So um, as we move on to containers, that changes slightly, or at least in, in my opinion, uh, changes slightly. So here's now a pipeline of a monolith, but that, that is containerized. And the, the key differences are instead of a Maven artifact that gets published, now there's going to be a Docker container that gets published um, to the Docker registry. And because, um, right, the, you know, um, I would be negligent to, to not mention, um, of course we have, we have OpenStack, right? So when you are, when you want to spin up a integration environment and, and perhaps if you want to deploy to production, um, the kind of, you know, over, over here, you can spin up uh, on demand kind of per, that scales as your dev organization scales. Um, and you can, you can definitely use OpenStack for that. And what's nice is, um, you know, once you've containerized things, it actually, it, it doesn't make, um, you get a little bit of cloud agnosticity, you know. You can sub in or sub out different, different clouds. Okay, so let's now go closer to a microservices pipeline. Um, and I, I promise this is leading somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, the first three are, are yeah, these three are just uh, pipelines of individual microservices. And I've kind of omitted, you know, the where OpenStack fits in. You can imagine that perhaps it's after building and testing the container, like where, where do you test it? Or perhaps it's um, after you've aggregated all of the containers and you want to d um, deploy your application, um, that's where you can also, you know, deploy, yes, yeah, so over here, deploy uh, the integration environment. So I, I guess the, the point I'm tr I wanna make is um, some people call these upper three, like lower, in, uh, lower build environments or lower pipelines that are necessary to, to deploy your application. So you have these lower environments or lower pipelines that publish your code to a Docker, uh, your Docker containers to a registry. And now your application is made up of five, 10 containers and the combination of all 10 get deployed um, and that is your application. So all 10 of them get tested together um, as kind of shown uh, at the bottom over here. Um, Right, so, okay, yeah, so I, I wanted to do a before and after of, hey, you know, we've talked about monoliths, we've talked about micro, microservices. Um, the assembly piece is actually kind of similar. You know, the um, it, POM files have dependencies of what, um, what jars you should have, you know, Maven. So I, I've been taking a, a Java, or I'm explaining this via Java terms because that's what I feel comfortable with, but if you're a Ruby person or if you're a Node person, you can probably mentally substitute, um, substitute in those, those technologies. So all I'm trying to say is here um, is that the assembly piece bears some resemblance between monoliths and, and, and microservices. So okay, I've given a lot of theory. I don't know if they're Top Gear fans in the audience, um, but given all this theory, I was like, okay, how hard can it be? Let's see this in, in reality. So what I'm about to show you um, is, I, I'm gonna go step by step and talk about an application. Let's see, okay. Um, so we're all here because OpenStack, we love it, we use it, right? So how, how are we gonna combine these pieces? There's OpenStack, there's containers we just went over. There's a monolithic app that's gonna get turned into a microservices app over here. And how do we put these all together? Okay, OpenStack is kind of you know the, the substrate. Now we have a lot of these different environments. Some are production, some are test, but overall, this is what we're going to do. 
And the way we're going to do this is via a, or the application that I'm going to take from a monolith to a microservice is a dashboard, um, specifically a, a dashing dashboard. And all of these will be, you know, this entire dashboard will be deployed onto an OpenStack cloud. Um, historically, you know, if you look, when you think of microservices, or when these, these companies go up and they talk about it, they, they show Twitter and they show, okay, the ads are one service and the tweets are another, or Spotify, you know, the recommended tunes. So in this case, um, each individual city will be a microservice eventually. So at first, everything is a monolith, and we're going to split things apart um, where each of these widgets or each of these tiles um, will, be, will be a microservice. So here is a, the weather dashboard as, as a monolith. And now I'm, I'm just kind of reinforcing um, these screenshots are from, from Electric Flow. And I'll give kind of a disclaimer um, in, in a bit. But here's just, you know, I showed kind of the abstract. This is the practical of, OK, here's a, here's a pipeline. And uh, what's interesting is, you know, these days everything can be done, um, or okay, not everything, but it, it's fun to put new things into containers. And uh, one thing that I did was the, in the testing phase, um, I, used, I used Selenium inside of a Docker container, and that's not something I've, um, I've done before. Um, and it was, so, I think it, it um, as we talk about testing in parallel and testing one thing to testing 10 things, it'll, it'll become relevant. But a shout out to um, Dave FP. He was the one who uh, created the weather widget over here. Um, and I just kind of build on top of that. So here is the weather dashboard as a deployment piece, right? So there, here's our monolith. There's one container that, can, that has everything. And how, okay, great, we have this container. What do we do to deploy it? We get an image, we run the image, and we, we create some links. Okay, so that's the monolith. And here's, so, um, yeah. I, so I'll, I'll go through this uh, via a video in a bit. I just wanna, I just wanna run through these slides. So, um, okay, so now a microservice, right? Again, kind of the three stages, pretty similar. And there are gonna be 17 containers. So Selenium, um, the fact that we're running Selenium inside a container, OK, now we can scale up and down those tests that have to be done per service, um, per, per microservice. But there are still, I, I think there are still improvements to be made um, for, for testing. Um, but I guess that it'll make sense in, in, in a little bit. Um, so the, the one kind of caveat is, uh, it, Doing this implementation, I introduce a little bit of coupling. So I think you can maybe see it here. Um, dashing, at least out of the box, um, there was no clean way for a microservice or a component to show or share UI. So there's this serialization at the top where it's, um, I get the, the dashboard that's just the layout. And now um, each of these 16 different widgets run and um, these, the 16, if something, if something fails, that's OK. One widget doesn't show up. But if something happens at the very top, um, that's a problem. And I think as people go from a monolith to a microservice, they'll, just as I ran into this, they, they will too. Um, so a few words before I demo. Um, you know, everything can, everything that I'm about to show you has been, so, you know, I'm, I'm an Electric Cloud employee. There's a community edition. So everything I'm showing you can be shown here, uh, can, be, can be accessed here. However, um, this is not a product pitch, right? So I am passionate about software delivery. Electric Flow is sort of my canvas, and it's easy for me to implement things there. So if you have another orchestration tool of choice, uh, whenever I say, whenever I mention the um, kind of terminology in the in the product that I'm working on, you can translate it. So, um, so I was going to do a demo, uh, a live demo actually, but um, I don't I don't have internet. So, um, yeah. So we'll have to go with this video that I that I made, but my timing is 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 going to be off um, a little bit, but. We'll have to, we'll have to go with this. Okay. So over here, I'm just showing kind of the different applications. So um, relevant to to our discussion uh, for for this talk are the monolith 
and the microservice. So um, I didn't clean that. This is a previous run. So I'm kind of five and six. So let's see. Let's go over here. Okay. Here is the, you know, I, this, I show this in a screenshot. Here is one component. It's a Docker container and it houses everything, the front end, the back end. And the deployment piece, okay, this is, you know, getting the image, running the image, and the links. <sighs> All right, so how do we kind of put this together in a pipeline? Um, I'm going to, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm executing kind of the monolith pipeline. So I showed kind of the definition. And over here, we're building the, the one container. We're testing the one container. And in, in particular, what I want to show is the, the Selenium tests that get run. So when you're advancing through a pipeline, um, I think it's, it's important to show, having automation, that's great. You need to surface that to your users so it can be you, so, it, okay. So, <laughs> so decisions can be made based on that automation. So over here we see kind of a default Selenium result. Um, and here's kind of the test suite. It's very, I don't know if anyone has written Selenium. This is a very, very basic, um, very basic example. But, um, you know, we can see the results. Um, and towards the end, we've, we've taken a screenshot. So, okay, we see this and we're like, okay, hey, looks good. You know, the Selenium tests have passed. The application looks like it's in a good state. Let's go ahead and, and publish this. Um, so I, I think in, yeah, in this example, I, I have two kind of manual approvals, um, the publishing and then finally going to deployment. And on my, uh, on my internet version, I, I took this out. Um, I just kind of combined the, the, te um, the publish and deploy. So over here, we're, we're just shipping it. And so now we've taken a monolith, built it, test it, put it on a registry, and now we're deploying it. And we can see over here, okay, <laughs> was a little bit too fast. Okay, we can see kind of the, you know, the widgets. And um, so, you know, this is a global conference. And so this one is in, in Fahrenheit because that makes sense to me. I'm, I already grew up with that. Don't worry, the next one will be in Celsius, so we don't leave anyone out. Um, so over here, I, I'm just doing a little bit of cleanup. Um, I should have really edited this out. Um, I, I reuse the same OpenStack environment. So what I'm doing here is I'm doing an undeploy. So I deploy the monolith, I'm undeploying the monolith, and then we're, I'm going to run the, um, the microservices application. So let's see. Okay, so the un undeployment succeeded. And here we have, um, yeah. Here's kind of the, the, the layout. And, and one thing that, um, that really comes up um, in, in my experience is the, the UI or any UI, right? Um, when you are trying to figure out a problem space, UIs is, are great and they, they allow for experimentation. At a certain point, there is a gap, right? Where it's like, okay, I've done something as a proof of concept. Now I really need to implement this in production. How do I go from one to, to 16 or to 100? Typically, central tools teams get run into this, or if you try to do something for real. Um, so what I actually did was um, I use a DSL, or I use a scripting mechanism, right? So you take one, um, and you, you just put a loop around it. And I think that um, at least the DSL aspect really saved me a lot of time on the demo. But I think that um, as as we go and go into microservices, um, even this actually, can you imagine kind of like making this in, the, in a UI? Um, as we explode and deploy more and more things, I think it's in, inevitable that code um, comes into ops and into production where um, you, yeah, you need to define your process as code. Um, otherwise you will, um, you'll have to kind of modify XMLs or use UIs and um, at least from, as a dev, I, I prefer it in code. So here is um, here's the the microservices pipeline, and it's it, it's it's pretty similar. The one thing, this is the assembly piece, and and how I modeled it. So now, great, you have all these containers. When it comes time to deploying, how do you specify which containers to use? 
So I specified a JSON um, blob kind of up front saying what's the city and what version um, of the container I should use. So again, you know, we, re we retrieved all the microservices. Okay, now we're testing them. And the difference now is each microservice, um, so I, I stopped at three, but you can kind of imagine these going to 16 or 50 or however m many you have. Um, now you have all of these individual test results that you need to look at and make a decision on. And um, yeah, so over here, I'm just kind of showing the same, the same kind of Selenium test. Okay, so uh, now that we, you know, the Selenium tests look good, let's ship it. And this deployment, um, in a second, we will see a link to the, to the dashboard, and then I guess we'll see kind of the um, individual widgets updating uh, one at a time. So, okay, so here's the dashboard. Okay, and yeah, as the deployment is happening, now the individual widgets are, are getting updated. And um, yeah, so that was, that's, okay, and it's Celsius, so, <laughs> um, so no, no one's left out. All right, so um, I'll, I guess I'll, at, at this point, I'll, I'll just kind of say some kind of concluding thoughts or um, as I was creating this or through my experience, you know, um, what were some, some of my thoughts? Um, so Selenium and Docker, so okay, w before it was testing, hey, um, when you have a monolith, there's only one thing to test. When you have microservices, there are tons of things. And Selenium and Docker were actually kind of a natural fit, um, even though that's kind of not, that's where you run Selenium is independent on if you go through with microservices or not. Um, from, from experience, I feel like a lot of organizations skip UI testing because it just takes too long. Um, you know, it, you can't run your entire test suite without bogging down the process. I, I feel like this is just an area that for improvement, you know, sort of how do we tame this te technology? And I know that, you know, Selenium has Selenium Grid and, and all of that, but um, um, th this middle piece is, I, I, maybe it's, it's controversial to me, or I, 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 I argue with some people. Um, I'm still undecided about packing it all into one container. Um, so what I mean by that is, um, if you look at, so the Docker container that I used for dashing was based on an open source version, like I think FRVI slash dashing, and there were volume mounts. Um, so the idea was, you take a container and then you volume mount in your code um, and you deploy that unit. And uh, what I did actually was I, I just packed it all in. I, I removed the volume mounts because they don't, um, sorry, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't get versioned or if you commit them, um, at least that's as of today, they, they don't get versioned. So I, I feel like the, uh, if you, if you don't pack it all uh, all in, you know, you have some interfaces or you lead, it's easier to, to reason about what is going on in this container and why, um, even though it, it gets harder to deploy in ops. But um, I'm still kind of, I, I've done it both both ways and um, I'm, I'm flip-flopping a little bit. Um, uh, the other part is uh, there's just so much, I, I showed a, a, some pipelines, but I left out a ton, you know. Um, Deploying, I deployed all the microservices. What happens if you want to only update one individual piece? Uh, what happens if you want to do zero downtime or rolling rolling deploys or, or, or rollbacks? And I think, um, you know, as your applications explode, um, it, the, the rollback becomes even more important or the rolling deployments become more important. And um, so I think mean time to recovery, I think, and mean time between failures. So. This also kind of ties into Selenium, where um, it, you know you you would like to have a robust unit, a robust testing environment or testing practice within your organization, but practically um, you can only do so much between and and business deadlines happen and you need to ship software, right? So um, as we increase complexity, we may have to consider changing our deployment practices such that. Um, it's easy to, to, to roll back. And I think I, I've seen, I've heard Facebook 
do this with, um, with mobile apps, actually, where they seed their um, kind of most loyal or, or um, staff um, or people who opt in for their alphas, and they really instrument the data, and they um, take a look at, uh, okay, let me back up. Because mobile devices are so, so many and so frequent, especially on Android, um, that they basically said, we can't test every single handset, you know, so we'll release this into the wild. We'll look at the, the metrics and the people who opt in for bleeding versions um, will g review their data before pushing out the actual application to the entire world. And I think that piece in mobile, um, I think we're gonna have to, to bring that into kind of um, the back end or, you know, this, this microservices um, architecture. And, um, and, and for what I did, you know, with the weather application, um, it, was, it was cheating a little bit, you know. Um, they all queried the same back end. Um, a more representative or a more perfect uh, example would have been querying different things or different endpoints. And not all of your services will be created equal. So that's just kind of the last, the last piece. Um, so, okay, so resources, right? Here's some resources. Um, Martin Fowler, of course, um, the book, the O'Reilly the book, I, I believe, uh, Building Microservices, um, or, or perhaps I, I, I got the wrong one. Um, I think, you know, surprisingly, for me at least, DZone actually has a really good um, series of posts. Um, and with that, um, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, Sure, I, I don't know if you want to, I can repeat the question or if you want to go to the mic. The pipeline you showed us is basically based on the traditional application development life cycle, CI life cycle, but in reality, we have to manage the OS and middleware part of the container image. Is there any good way to manage OS and middleware part of the image in conjunction with application layer? Yeah, um, so the question <laughs> was that, hey, in the pipelines, I focused on, um, I, I, I glossed over the middleware aspect and what are some strategies, you know, to, um, to manage that. So, you know, um, there's some open source tools like Packer, for example, that go from a blueprint and result in to, to a, a Docker container. Um, I believe even the configuration management tools, they, they also um, provide an ability to, to build containers. Um, so yes, you're correct, I did, I did leave that out. Um, <laughs> so that would be just yet another pipeline um, or another piece of your application manifest, you know? Um, hey, which, which base image or, or where do I, um, it's another input. Okay, yeah, so, um, you know, I, so, I, I said earlier, um, I, I was uh, part of the Electric Flow plugins team, so we've written a, um, a, a driver, or, or sorry, like a, like a plugin that calls um, the OpenStack APIs. Um, so what we did is we, so, I may actually have this, we, I, I ran this on Helion. Um, I don't know if anyone else is sad that Helion's going away, but um, yeah, we, we provisioned these two uh, these two images, um, and um, yeah, so we, we provisioned it via the REST API. Then we had a um, an agent actually running on this VM. Not on a host. Right? Sorry. The container's running on a VM running in a tenant, yeah. basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, Kubernetes or Mesos or Docker Swarm or what is it running? No, it's this is just an Ubuntu image. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So it's all running on one VM, basically. Yeah, so that's another, um, okay, I see where the question is. Um, the, all the microservices that I, now that you see this this image, right? Um, yeah, I, I put them all on one, one VM. Um, so you can imagine, so, you know, last week at, um, at, at another talk, I, I split things up into different VMs. The problem, or well, the problem that I ran into was you need service registry or service discovery. Otherwise, it becomes really hard. And uh, for this demo, um, 
you know, let's just, we'll just minimize this. <laughs> um, no, it's, it, it, in order for a complete example, yeah, um, you, you do need to put these into um, individual or, or more than just one or two. Yeah, so um, what I did, um, I, I reused an OpenStack environment. So instead of kind of the deploy and teardown, um, just like I had instructions on how to take an application and put it on, um, I have the instructions on how to clean slate it. So since everything's inside the container, all I have to do is undeploy the, the oh, okay, the containers. Um, so that's how I, I, I cleaned it up. Um, all right, um, yeah, I'll, so I just got the notice that time's up. Um, so thank you, OpenStack, for um, for inviting me. At, you know, for this. And, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>